Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, Pivoters, wherever you are in the world today. Thanks for tuning in with us here in the lounge. Today, my very special guest is Dr. Graham Lau, and we are going to be talking about the secret life of an astrobiologist. What does that mean? Well, we're going to go into, well, what is astrobiology and how that is tied into life and consciousness, uh, intelligence, consciousness, excuse me, and what that means for civilization longevity and why the daily life, the average person should actually think about this and the way that they make decisions. We're also going to be talking about the overview effect and how we can connect our meditation practice so that we can have a better perspective on the way that we move through our internal and external worlds. Dr. Graham, I'm really excited to have you on the show today. Awesome. So, so thankful. So happy to join you um, and excited to chat on these topics. Yeah, um, we met at AAC earlier this year, the Analog Astronaut Conference, and I just remember we were having such a great conversation. We were always laughing and, uh, and having a great time. We were talking about things all the way from, you know, building a campfire and looking up at the stars to what astrobiology is and, and everything in between. So I'm really excited that we get to bring these topics to the audience today. Yeah, me too. So when we talk about life and intelligence consciousness, I think a lot of people understand these words when they're used separately, but when they're put together, there's probably a lot of interpretation that comes into play. Can I ask you, what does this mean to you and how would you define this to somebody else? Yeah, so my favorite thing about life, intelligence, and consciousness that a lot of people seem to be unaware of is that there is no rigorous set definition of any of those three things. Mm -hmm. We don't really know what life is. There have been over 300 attempts to define life. All of the definitions are a little bit different. One that you hear regularly in, in space exploration is what's called the NASA definition. It was created in a workshop uh, by a NASA working group back in the, the mid 90s. Uh, this, this definition says that, that life is a self-contained uh, chemical system capable of undergoing Darwinian evolution. But even that misses out on a few things that could be living processes. There could be mineral or rock press processes mm. that could be considered living, um, artificial intelligence, robotics in the future. At what point does AI become conscious and aware? At what point does it become life? That's not contained inside of our definitions currently. And so we don't really know what life is. And when it comes to intelligence, we don't actually really know what intelligence is. We certainly know that we have intelligence. We can say that right. to some degree. Um, certainly, we've built smartphones and computers and live stream systems and cars and all kinds of things. And, you know, we've, we've sent humans to space already. Um, but then, you know, I, I look at my dogs and I know that they're very intelligent. You know, they Absolutely. have intelligence. My, my one dog especially is very good at tricking me into doing the things that she wants me to do. <laughs> That's very intelligent. We know chimpanzees can use sticks to fish for termites. Uh, we've right. known that for several decades now. We see intelligence in lots of creatures mm -hmm. and in different ways. We see like you social insects. Uh, like mm. bees and ants, how they they have different structures, different social hierarchies inside of their hives, their nests. And we see what appears like a group intelligence that kind of emerges amongst these individuals that don't appear to have that intelligence themselves. Right. But then on top of that, we have consciousness. And so we really don't know what consciousness is. There's mm. so such a huge spectrum of different ideas of what it means for us to be aware of ourselves right now but also to think about where consciousness comes from and whether or not our current perception, our current awareness will help or hinder us when it comes to trying to communicate with other conscious beings out there, specifically with other beings from other biospheres, aliens in the universe. Mm. I love that you tied into the fact that there is no one definition uh, for any of these words and the fact that they've changed over time or based on who is providing the definition. I think that's true of all the words in our language. And it really depends on, you know, who's providing the definition, what, what social society do they live in? What's the culture background? What education do they have, et cetera? And then the interpretation. Uh, and as you were speaking about the bees and the ants that I actually got the name for our show today from the secret life of bees. Uh, and I thought that that was a great play on words. So uh, when when we look at um, these three things, how does this tie into our civilization and what it means for longevity? Yeah, I mean, we as humans have only just barely become aware of ourselves in the cosmos. 
You know, life has been here on Earth for something like four billion years. We don't actually know when life started. We don't even know if it started here on our own planet. It might have started right. on Mars or Venus and then been brought here by a rock. We, we really don't know for sure. It does seem like it started here based on our current knowledge, but it took billions of years for life to go from, from single-celled organisms to multi-celled organisms and then to develop plants and animals and fungi. And we've only really been around for a very short blink of cosmic existence so far. Uh, the Homo genus that we come from has been around for maybe 2 million years. Our human subspecies has been around for maybe 200,000 years, somewhere in that mm. range. There's, those numbers always shift a little bit based, based on what, you know, anthropologists are learning about, you know, finding new fossils and things and trying to piece together our history. But it's definitely a very short existence. And for us to have written record over the past 10,000 or so years, and then our current cultures of, you know, a few centuries, um, and then some things that are going on are only a few decades. You know, we've only been going to space for 60 some years so far. Uh, it's only about a century since we discovered that other galaxies even exist, that there isn't just one sole galaxy in the universe. And, and so much of our knowledge is changing so very quickly. And with that knowledge, with our explorations of our, our place here in the cosmos, it makes us want to know more about what life and intelligence and consciousness are, because if there is something else out there, the question is, you know, how do we find it? How do we recognize it? Will yes. we recognize alien life if we see it? We don't know yet. It right. might look like us or it might be wildly different. And that might really force us to think about what life is. And when it comes to intelligence and consciousness, honestly, there might be differences in how some alien beings have come to perceive the universe around them that might make their awareness of themselves, their consciousness in the universe, markedly different from what we know. Mm. Could you give an example of what that might be? I mean, I, it's hard to conceive of something that we have not experienced ourselves, but. Uh, yeah, there, there could... are some fun ways to explore that in science fiction, especially. Uh, I'm a huge nerd for sci fi books <laughs> and video games and movies and, and television. Uh, I really love Ted Chiang's short stories. He's a remarkable writer. He oh, writes yes, great he stories using a bunch of like you no know, language and mathematics and culture yes. and philosophy. Um, he wrote the the short story uh, stories of your of our lives, um, which was the basis for the film Arrival. Mm. And in this story, right. you have this alien species that has a different perception of time than we do, and they they perceive time in a cyclical nature, and so they're perceiving time kind of both the beginning and end of a, a story at the exact same time. They yes. know the end of the sentence before they start to speak the sentence. Right. And so this linguist in the story kind of has to discover that for herself. And I really love that exploration of what it means because when I start a sentence, when I start speaking, my brain isn't telling me what's at the very end of right. that sentence. We, we, we don't think that way. We don't perceive that way. We, we see time very linearly. Um, and so I, I love the idea of beings perceiving time different. Um, not just how time flows, but also there might be a possibility that they, they see time uh, differently in the lengths of time. Mm. We evolved uh, to see scales of space that are you know, roughly like a couple of millimeters out to a few meters are pretty easy for humans. We start talking about you know, you know, light years of distance in between stars. A lot of human minds, like we can't comprehend what mm. that distance really means. Uh, the same thing for time. You know, I, I can feel seconds pass by when I'm, you know, holding a plank pose or something. I'm counting out the seconds. Like they might seem longer than other seconds, but they're still. I can still count them. Uh, I can feel minutes. I can feel hours. Um, most humans are actually pretty bad at like remembering days and weeks and months and years, or thinking ahead by days and weeks and months and years. We think we're pretty good at it, but we're we're actually not made to think that way. Mm -hmm. um, it's very hard for me to bring back everything that happened throughout the entire day, uh, 127 days ago. Um, right. You can't do that so easily. Um, whereas maybe there are alien beings who have a different sense of time. Maybe short time spans are like millennia for them, or maybe they exist for such vast, long periods of time that all of our actions, all of our lives are a blink of an eye for them. Right. It makes me think about things like the bristlecone pines out here in Colorado, the oldest trees on our planet. They've been around for thousands of years. Uh, the oldest one, Methuselah, is some 5,600 years old, I believe. I'd have wow. to check the numbers, but very old for a tree. Uh, think about all that's happened in human civilization while that tree has been alive. I mean, that tree was alive right. when they were building the Great Pyramids. Right. Um, mammoths were still in existence when that tree started to grow. 
uh, everything that we know of in modern human history happened during the life of that tree. And so if that tree were conscious and aware, it wouldn't really have any need to think at all or to worry about the years that are passing by for us. Mm, absolutely. That is such a great example. Thank you for sharing that. And also for bringing up uh, Ted Chang as a sci-fi writer. I had read his book, Exhalation, uh, last year. And that was his, uh, I think, recent book with additional stories. And uh, it, some of the concepts he presents there in in how we might you know, be able to visit our parallel lives and parallel selves, for example, are just so mind bending that it it makes you put the book down and you just kind of go off on these tangents of thought in what if that was reality, right? And as you say, that could very well be reality for other beings. And how would we perceive that unless we can even conceive of it? And so it's it's not everyone's brain that can even come up with that kind of concept. So then to you know, notice it on the kind of day-to-day -day basis is uh, quite challenging. Yeah, absolutely. Even amongst humans, we have people who perceive things differently. There right. are some differences of human perception. Uh, some people are able differently. Some people don't have eyesight. So vision isn't something for them, but they have a different right. level of hearing. Um, right. You know, some people are colorblind. And so trying to explain certain colors to them is actually extremely difficult. Um, Absolutely. You know, when you don't have a reference for what a certain color, like a yellow or a green or a red might actually look like to someone who who sees differently. And, and even amongst animals alone on our planet, uh, there's a, a, a talk I've given many times. I'm currently writing it into a book uh, called The Craziest Creatures on Earth, where I, I talk about some of the weird biology on our planet. And there are so many creatures that have wildly different types of biology than, than we humans do including things like perception. There, there are creatures that hear and see far differently than we do. And can you give us an example of that as well? Um, one of my favorite examples is the greater wax moth. Uh, this moth uh, has the greatest known range of hearing of any creature on our planet. Um, wow. So if you know how hearing works, you know the, the, the air molecules around us in space, uh, when you make a, a sound, like when I speak, my voice is actually vibrating those air molecules and those vibrations move as waves through the space around and here they're being picked up by an electric device and put out to other electric devices and then turned into waves that all are touching your ears. Uh, those vibrations you hear as sounds, we humans hear roughly two of those waves per second or two hertz out to about 20,000 hertz. Uh, those of us who are getting a little bit older in our age, we actually slowly start to lose those higher frequencies uh, yeah. That's why if you go to certain uh, parking lots, especially in the UK, they have these anti-loitering devices, which is basically a high frequency audio device that transmits like 19,000 to 20,000 hertz. Yeah. Um, basically, so only teenagers can hear it <laughs> and it hurts their ears. But then, you know, if you're 65 and you walk in the parking lot, you don't hear it at all. That is um, hilarious. And so it's yeah, one, one way to deter youngsters. From, um, I, I hate using that term, but to deter young, young people from, from being around your area. But there are other kinds of hearing out there. Uh, those of us who have dogs and love our dogs, our dogs right. uh, can hear out to 50,000 hertz or 50 kilohertz. Uh, so a dog whistle. I've heard people claim they can hear dog whistles. It's physically impossible. The human ear does not have the biological apparatus to hear a dog whistle. So you will, you will never hear a sound coming from a dog whistle. Someone can blow on it all day. And if you think you're hearing a sound, it's more in your mind. You're, you're telling right, yourself you're, you're hearing something. Um, but there are other sounds, uh, other ranges of hearing too, like dolphins and bats that have echolocation. Mm. They're right. also really good at using echolocation to hunt their prey. And so evolutionarily, those things that are eaten by, say, dolphins or bats might want to hear a little bit better. And right. that's the case of the greater wax moth. It is primarily preyed upon by bats. And okay. so it's evolved a range of hearing that's greater than the bats that are using echolocation to try to find out where it's at. They hear from rough, roughly 50,000 hertz to about 300,000 hertz. Wow. On our best guesses. Uh, that's 300 kilohertz. That's, that's like the low radio wave uh, level. Um, so like the airport beacons, those little lights flashing at the ends of airports are actually yeah. emitting a little radio signal for airplanes. Yes. Um, a greater wax moth could hear that signal. Wow. Um, that radio wave being put out for our airplanes. They, they have that range of hearing. Uh, and so it's a huge range. It's 250,000 waves um, right. of, of, of range. It's also entirely outside of the human range of hearing. 
I was just going to so ask, say that. Everything you're hearing from my voice right now, the greater wax moth could not hear mm -hmm. that. And everything the greater wax moth can hear, you cannot hear. Okay. And so our brains can't actually process how alien that is. We know, we, we know what, what sounds are happening in that range. We can right. record those sounds and trans transfer them to our audible range. And we can look at data showing us, you know, peaks in those sounds from different kinds of things. But what we really don't mentally know, we don't, we don't perceptually know what that sounds right. like. And so that could very well be the case with other alien life forms that might not be on this planet or, or might be, but because we can't hear to that level or see, we're not able to perceive them. So they could be attempting to communicate with us, but because we don't even know how to look for that signal, we can't pick it up. Yeah, there's a, a quote from the second book in the Dune series by Frank Herbert that I really like in Dune Messiah. It's, uh, what sense do we lack that we can't experience a universe all around us? Mm. Um, there are basically, you know, possibilities that there are other kinds of perception that we don't really have that other beings are, temp you, know, you know, tuning into. Maybe a sense of static electricity, um, mm. a sense of of, uh, of gravity, a sense of, of uh, magnetic field lines. There, there is a chance that we humans have a vestigial sense of magnetic fields, and there are some people who are looking into that right now, and it's it's kind of interesting research. Yeah. But even if our ancestors did, we currently don't. And if the, if our ancestors did and we currently don't, would you say there's a way that we could develop it and bring it back? Or would that, we, we've lost the physical capability, not just the ability to tune in? That's a very fun question. So so I know one researcher who's looking into this. His name is Joe Kirschvink. Uh Joe is rather famous in the geology realm. Uh, he's done a lot of really cool work in paleomagnetism, uh, trying to okay. understand the history of our world based on magnetic fields and how, you know, the the magnetic particles inside of rocks were aligned at certain times. He helped us, you know, figure out the structure of the flipping of magnetic poles on earth, as well as the history of glaciations of the earth, this, this, these ideas of snowball earth periods that have happened in the past. Um, right. But Joe's also interested in whether or not we had this magnetic sense as humans at one point. And so he's been testing people in this magnetic field line cage, kind of like a Faraday cage, to see if they can tap into changes in magnetic field lines. And he's had some interesting results. Uh, I'm not, I'm not yet convinced he's actually shown that we have that currently, but there might be a chance that we had it at one point. And we know that many species on the planet currently have a magnetic sense perception. Birds have it. It's how they migrate and they can migrate, mm -hmm. you know, over great distances and then still come back to the same lakes, the same places in the summer and the winter. Uh, sea turtles use it to leave the beach they were born on and go on a trip of many thousands of miles over a lifetime. Mm -hmm and then come back to that exact same location and that exact beach. Um, part of that is based on magnetic field lines. Uh, and some time ago, and, and what got Joe interested into in this, and I was talking to him about this, uh, there was someone who was, was using Google Earth and just kind of like looking at Google Earth images. And I, I think this might be like 10, 15 years ago. Um, okay. I don't quite remember exactly when it happened, but, but they noticed that cows in these, all these Google Earth images were roughly standing north to south. Oh, and at that time, we had we had no knowledge that cows might have a magnetic sense perception, but the person went through and, and showed that a lot of cows align themselves around magnetic field lines, and so wow. there's a chance that they have some kind of magnetite, you know, vestigial organ probably in their brains as well that's allowing them to align themselves along these field lines. Um, so if we meet an alien species that doesn't prioritize touch or smell or sight or hearing right. like we do, may maybe they prioritize other senses like magnetic sense perception or the sense of static electricity or or they view things in a different realm of the the, the EM spectrum. Maybe what right. we see as visible light is not visible to them. Maybe they see entirely in infrared or ultraviolet. Um, mm. There's a lot of possibilities that might change altogether how they've developed language and culture and Absolutely. society. Uh, there's, there's a lot of things that, that are very much based on our perception is how we developed our society. That is such an interesting point. And um, I'm just noticing in the comments, Terry Trevino is saying he's been sneaking around this topic as well. Um, <laughs> Terry so has been... indeed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it definitely sounds like we could go down some rabbit holes with it. And what I also heard was that Magneto might actually be a possibility if this was something <laughs> that we had in the past. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's kind of cool, right? Like a lot of these yeah. ideas would come from science fiction, including comic books and superhero ideas. Who knows what the future may hold? We, we might actually see a future where we can, if not tap into something that could be there, 
uh, we might actually end up genetically modifying ourselves to bring out certain traits, including some that might seem superhuman to us now. Um, right. You know, there are there are forms of technology that may be so sufficiently advanced, as Isaac Asimov once said, that they might appear as magic. Absolutely. I mean, if you think about the technology that we have now, if we were to time travel into the past um, 500 years ago, it absolutely would be considered magic, right? Because yeah. we would have had no concept anywhere close to that realm. Um, you know, try, I, I asked um, a group of um, people wants to explain an iPhone, like pretend they went back 500 years and, and describe what an iPhone is and what it does to people who would have obviously no understanding. And it's a very difficult exercise. So we, we that then proves this point of how difficult it can be to connect with something when we can't even understand it. Yeah, I mean, a lot of our technology is that way. A lot of people, if they took a smartphone back in time 500 years, and the phone ran out of battery, they wouldn't know how to charge that phone. Right. Um, a lot of people don't have that knowledge, and it's kind of unfortunate. Uh, as Carl Sagan once, you know, pointed out, we we live in this time where we are exquisitely dependent on science and technology, mm -hmm. and yet few people really have an in-depth understanding of science and technology, and that's an unfortunate thing about our our modern era, I think, as well. Absolutely. And what, so with all of this technology, I mean, we're talking about, you know, the life and intelligence, consciousness, and then civilization longevity. And you just hit it on the point of technology. We are so dependent upon it. And so what's going to happen if there's a solar flare and all of our technology does go down? Do What systems are in place that actually make sure we can get the knowledge back, right? Because everything yeah. is electronically stored. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on that? I will say, so we, 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 we've stored things in ways that aren't just electronic. Um, even the Library of Congress, everything is stored on microfiche, on, on small microfilm, um, magnetic tape, and that kind of stuff. But we also do have other repositories out there on our planet. There are things like seed vaults. Um, so Svalbard uh, yes, in the High Arctic, for instance, is one great example of a place we've been storing seeds of different species, including some that no longer exist. Um, mm. I love that idea. I love the idea of having like DNA vaults as well. Yeah. Um, some, you know, some there are a few different organizations that are working on sending DNA into space and have done so already in different ways. Um, there's a lot of reasons for us to be catalog cataloging all of the genetics we have right now on our planet of different species and populations. Um, but we also do have places we've stored other things. Um, there are certainly large repositories of, of books, of resources um, from Fort Knox and places like that where we're storing gold to underground salt mines where we actually do store a lot of records of certain things. Um, so I'm not too concerned if, if we okay. had a major technological disaster. I think we humans are resilient and could rebound. I will say it's worth checking out the work of the Long Now Foundation. Um, Long Now Foundation. Yeah, the Long Now Foundation is a nonprofit organization headquartered in San Francisco. They're doing a lot of really cool work in thinking about, you know, what is the 10,000 year future of humanity? Mm. Now, not just tomorrow, not just next year or a century, not just 2200. You know, what is life like you know, 10,000 years from now? Um, currently, they have several projects in the works. One of those is building a generational clock that will tick out time over thousands of years with no human intervention. Um, with the support of Jeff Bezos, they're, they're building that down in a, in a, a, a small cave, a small uh, hole in a mountain in Texas. Um, but they're, they also have a group who are securing works for the future. Um, so they had this okay. idea, like, what, what books do we need? If civilization were to collapse tomorrow for some reason, what right. books would we want to have preserved to allow us to restart civilization? Okay. And so, you know, that, that can include everything from, like, basic textbooks on chemistry and mathematics to books on gardening and, you know, how to build right. things, engineering things. Um, you know, there is I'll a lot of collective knowledge. As yeah. well. <laughs> yeah. And so there's a lot of things we would want to have. Um, yes. I will say when it comes to civilizational longevity, I, I'm less worried about a large thing like a solar flare or something like that happening. I think today, just as much as it was when I was a child, the biggest threat is ourselves. It's nuclear mm -hmm. warfare. Um, you know, even right now, we in the world, we have multiple wars going on right now across the world. There are atrocities happening amongst many innocent people across our entire planet. And, you know, some of those wars do have the potential to kickstart us into a place where we destroy ourselves. Yes. Um, in astrobiology, we have this thing called the Drake equation, 
Um, Drake, first you. postulated by, by Dr. Frank Drake in 1960, it was actually the syllabus. Uh, it was the conference proceedings for a small organization, a small meeting he got together. Um, basically, it lays out uh, what do we need to know to find out how many communicating civilizations might be in our galaxy right now. And so Drake sat down and started just laying out this equation. He started with the rate of star formation in our galaxy. And he figured, you know, if we have so many stars being born at any time, how many of those stars have planets? How many of those planets are Earth-like? How many of those have life? Of those that have life, how many have intelligence? Of those, how many have developed radio communication? Um, but to tie it all back together and give us just a flat number, he included this last factor in the equation. And it's my favorite part of the equation. It's the L factor or the civilizational longevity, the lifetime of a civilization. And it was a really poignant time to include that in that calculation because in 1960, we were becoming very, very aware of our ability to eradicate ourselves from the mm. planet. Um, you know, people will talk all the time, like the end of the earth, the earth is going to die. No, the earth is fine. Earth, earth is going to live. <laughs> the earth is gonna survive gonna die. We that. humans are what might die. We might kill ourselves, yeah. not the planet. Uh, and so the L factor is really a, 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 a realization that there might be some factors or some filters, um, as we now call them, great filters to life becoming multi-planetary, to life existing for long periods. Maybe a civilization really does just thrive for a thousand or 10,000 years and then go away. Hmm. Maybe the average lifetime of a civilization is much longer. And we have to get past this, this likelihood of us destroying ourselves to really learn uh, what the next filter will be. And what are some of these filters that um, are adopted with this view? Yeah, and there are various uh, attempts to understand this idea of the great filter um, or what a great filter might be. Uh, so, so the potential for killing ourselves is one of them. Uh, threats from your own planet could be a big one. So volcanic activity, earthquakes, uh, mm -hmm. natural hazards that occur. There's also, you know, the fact that we are rapidly changing our own planet right now. We, we see climate changing markedly across the surface of our world, but yeah. we're also technologically now aware of it and we could act to do something about it. And so one filter might actually be whether or not a civilization learns global scale geoengineering. Okay. Um, Dr. David Grinspoon, who wrote a really great book I have here, my bookshelf, Earth and Human Hands. Um, I actually, I think I have like three or four of his books back here behind me. Uh, Dr. David Grinspoon is currently the senior scientist for astrobiology strategy at NASA. Um, he's also posited this idea that, that maybe we are going into or could be going into a new era called the Sapiozoic or the era of intelligence, um, as he calls it. Um, what might allow for that to happen could be this, this discovery that not only are we harming the planet right now or harming our position on the planet, but that we could actively change the planet, the entire atmosphere, the entire ocean, we can change things to better fit life for us. And maybe one reason that aliens haven't, haven't said hi to us yet is that we haven't overcome one of these filters and it could be warfare or it could be large scale geoengineering. Um, mm -hmm. And there are, there are some others that are also kind of fun to talk about in sci-fi. Um, if you're gonna go there, it's, that's up to you. Yeah, no, that I mean, that is that is very fascinating, because that is something that I've often thought about myself as, you know, the, I do believe that it exists. I highly doubt that we are the most intelligent beings in this entire universe, right? All the galaxies and all the star systems and everything. And to your point earlier, depending on how we define intelligence, maybe the intelligence is so far beyond our capacity of understanding and they have different senses, right? And so we think it's a rock, for example, when it very much is not, and it can do things that we cannot, but where there's, you know, the ability for them to maybe communicate with us is there, but maybe they don't want to because they think, well, what's what's the point? You're not smart enough yet. You haven't evolved to a, a point where we want to welcome you to the Feder Federation of Galaxies, right? <laughs> and so that's that's always been something that I've thought about. Um, yeah. Is this some some of this stuff? I know you run a podcast with NASA diving into astrobiology. Do you talk about these fun topics on there as well? We do. Uh, just gosh, a couple of years ago now, I had Dr. Sue Schneider on the show. Uh, she's currently the director of the Center for the the gosh the Center for the Human Mind. I think it's called. I, I actually forget. It's at Florida Atlantic University. 
Um, she does a lot of research in the realm of the philosophy of intelligence, uh, mm. artificial intelligence, altering the human mind and the future. And she and I had a conversation when she was on the show about whether or not it's more likely for alien civilizations to be what we call post-biological. Okay. Um, so we currently are biological beings. Right. We are a biological civilization. We are built of genes. We're built of DNA, biological molecules. But right now we are building a post-biological civilization by creating AI. Right. We're creating these large language models and generative AI. And, and now there's a lot of discussion of, of will AGI happen? Will we create this artificial general intelligence sometime in the coming years. Um, we're actually at the point where it could be just a few years away. Wow. Um, some of us will argue that it may be a bit, bit further than that, but yeah. at the same time, we can see it. We can perceive this possibility. And if that's possible, that we might not only create AI and the post-biological, we might create our own replacement. We mm. might end up replacing ourselves by choice with the artificial version of us and, and whether or not that thing chooses to call itself human still, right. that's, a, that's a huge question. But if we can perceive that and our civilization has only been around for some 10,000 ish years, then does that mean that the L factor of the Drake equation for biological civilizations is quite small mm. and perhaps the L factor for post biological civilizations is that's quite right. large, which might imply that most alien civilizations are, are machines, they're artificial intelligence. Right. So and major matrix. part of why they're not talking to us is that we are not good enough yet. Right. Oh, that's, that is a, such a mind bending concept, right? Too. <laughs> and, and Terry, I can see is, is getting really excited, geeking out with us on, on these topics. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's really fascinating. You know, I still remember when uh, Bicentennial Man came out with Robin Williams and everyone was just like the mind was blown at that concept. And now it, it seems not so far fetched, just like with a lot of technology in sci fi, right? A lot of the technology in Star Trek used to be something that we used to think was magical or could could never happen. And yet we use a lot of that technology in our day to day lives now. Yeah. And I, I think science fiction, the beauties of science fiction is not just that science fiction writers, creators, that they dream of where technology is and can go. They also remind us that we need moral philosophy. Mm. We need ethical practices, sustainable practices, and thoughtful practices when it comes to how we apply technology. Um, you know, one of the, the greatest science fiction stories of all time was Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, written yeah. back in the 1800s. Um, if you read Frankenstein, the people always like that they'll point out that the monster wasn't the, the, the creature. It was Frankenstein himself, the, the Dr. Victor Frankenstein. And really the, the story is that he creates life. He creates this being. He creates the new thing like we're creating AI right now. Right. But rather than giving it love and care and teaching it and helping it grow, he casts it away and he shows it pain and hate and and all these negative things that we don't want to, to do ourselves right now with our own creations like AI. It's one right. reason why a lot of us have talked about whether or not we, we think it'd be good for a, a, an AI or AGI to have emotions. Mm. Um, one of my favorite parts in the film of the book Sphere, uh, Michael Crichton wrote the book and, and was involved in the movie. Um, my favorite part is when they're talking to what they think is an alien being and it's, it's, it lets them know that it's angry. Um, or let's know it, it, it's sad. And uh, the, the psychologist on, on the ship, he's like, you know, I'd, I'd much rather this thing didn't have any emotions at all, because if it can feel happiness, if it can feel sadness, what happens if it gets angry at us? Mm. Um, and that's a very important thing for us to remember. And, you know, even as long ago as Mary, you know, Mary Shelley sitting and writing this horror story for some friends um, reminds us that we do have to think actively about what we're doing and what we're creating. Absolutely. It's that it's the moral responsibility, as you said. Um, and, and I just watched Guardians of the Galaxy number three. I don't know if you've seen it I yet. Seen that one yet. Um, and I won't give anything away, but there is this character who goes and makes these creations, but because he's seeking perfection, right? He he casts away the ones that he deems are not up to standard or up to par. And then you see through the film like what effect that has. Uh, and it's it's something that I think people might overlook in the excitement of creation, of figuring it out, right? And and that allure of solving the problem, so to speak. 
but then there are a lot of knock-on effects that we need to consider that is that is very important to consider because that again the long-term view right what is that going to do not only to what we're creating but to to ourselves to other species that we share the planet with yeah absolutely and honestly like i i love you know discussions about technology and where we are currently and what we can teach our children about science and technology engineering mathematics we talk so much about the importance of stem careers and stem fields and building this great new future but but you know, we we so often neglect the arts and the humanities oh, and absolutely. talking about philosophy and teaching children about things like meditation and how to deal with their emotions and yeah. how to how to be human together. Um, it's one reason that you know I, I do think right now that astrobiology, the overview effect, space exploration, this this view right now of where the future can go, it's a really strong reminder that that we need to be having those conversations now. We need to be teaching those skills now of, for people to learn how to be present with themselves. Uh, we, we look around the world, we see so much animosity and hatred and pain. And in those things, you know, the, the suffering of life is a natural part of life. But yes. again, perhaps one of these great filters for, for aliens and for civilizations in the cosmos is to become aware enough of our own creation of suffering that we want to do something to make it better. Mm. Um, and so, you know, I, I do worry about a future where we just push and push and push to engineer more and to make more and to consume more without thinking actively about why we would do those things and how we can do those things well for each other. Mm. That was really well stated. Thank you. I have two questions from that. So the first one is, how would you define astrobiology to the average person who is wouldn't know anything about the the subject? And then two, the how to be human, how do you think we can start introducing this into, into education? Because I believe that that is also a big oversight. You know, we, we forget about all of those things in this quest of, as you said, more and doing rather than being. And it's, it's almost like we have to rewind ourselves a bit and teach, you know, we, if we're not taught, we only model what's shown to us. And then based on where we are in today's world, uh, you know, there's a lot of this technology, machines, and so we're not necessarily learning how to be human. We're learning how to be operators of devices or just efficient wheels, uh, cogs in a wheel. Yeah, um, agreed. Um, so, yeah, so a few answers. First off, with astrobiology, um, and I'm glad you asked, like, what my definition is, because mine's actually a little bit different than the general definition. If you go to the NASA astrobiology website, uh, I hope you do. It's astrobiology.nasa.gov. Um, just a pitch for my friends, a uh, great program. <laughs> um, but if you go there, you'll see that astrobiology is defined as the study of the origins, the evolution, the distribution, and the future of life in the universe. Okay. Um, it's a very scientific approach to what astrobiology is doing. But for me, astrobiology is simply our quest to understand the nature of life. So astrobiology is a holistic view that incorporates all human knowledge of what it means for our existence, uh, whether or not we can understand where we've come from and where we're going, and whether or not we're alone. And, and those are big questions that have been around since before we had the word science. These are mm -hmm. questions we've been asking ourselves for many millennia in various ways, from different approaches to religion, um, different ideologies and belief systems, to the development of science and using you know, tools of empiricism and skepticism and reason to better understand our place in the universe, not just to build our future, but to really learn about where we are and where we're going. And for that, I really think that brings value to education. So I, I think that we actually should be teaching astrobiology for students yeah. at any school level, that we should be <laughs> teaching students to ask these bigger, grander questions they inspired me as a young child. They inspired our ancestors thousands of years ago. So, of course, they can inspire the next generation. Um, I also think that for young students to be able to be with themselves, to be present and to be aware mm -hmm. and to think a bit deeper, you know, we don't just want to talk about, you know, like critical thinking and, and, and philosophy and, and what we know of ethics. We really should be teaching meditation in schools. Yeah. Meditation is such a powerful practice. There's many different forms of it. Um, some meditation practices can be very secular and very individual for, for each person. Uh, if anything, it, it helps us to learn to not be bored. 
Yes. Um, you know, if anything, I, I kind of like those moments of just being alone with nothing to do. Those are moments that we should we should enjoy for what they are, not right. feel the need to pop out our cell phone and start scrolling through endless videos online. We shouldn't need a supplication, you know, that 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 gives us dopamine hits. We we should be able to be happy and present with ourselves no matter what our emotional state is. Mm. Once we start that process, it gets a lot easier then to recognize our emotional states when they're happening and yes. to have a, just a, a little bit more control, um, a little bit more awareness of what those emotional states are, um, what gets us into those emotional states and what brings us out of them. Um, I've said and done a lot of things in my life that were driven purely by emotion that honestly I had very little control over in the moment. And you know, I look back on those times and I'm like, man, I really wish I, I'd had some more awareness of that moment. I wish I'd been present a bit more. And, and honestly, I, I think learning meditation, it kind of messes with our time perception a little bit. It allows us to expand those moments just a little bit more to give us more agency inside the moments when they're happening. And mm. that's powerful. That, that I think is something all of our world leaders need for sure. Um, you know, Edgar Mitchell once said when looking back at the earth from the moon, that it made him want to grab a politician by the scruff of the neck and drag them out there and make them look at it. Um, mm. because it's a, it's an eye opening thing. It, it makes us aware we need greater awareness and that can come through education on our place in the cosmos, like learning about our place in space. It can come through learning about astrobiology and these grand questions of whether or not we're alone and how we got here. And it can come through having just those moments of being present with ourselves through meditation. And so I, I think that's extremely valuable in education far more so than trying to force students to memorize mathematical formulae and, and, you know, different things that we've learned through science. Thank you for that. That, that is um, uh, a, an amazing way to wrap it all together. And I love how you explain that meditation can expand the moment so that we can be present within it for a longer period of time. And it's that witnessing and observing of the moment as well as the experiencing. And when we can have that, we have greater equanimity with whatever is taking place. And that is what allows us to regulate the emotion and to, you know, be with it rather than trying to avoid it immediately or, or cling to it and hold on. And, you know, I, I think we have not done a very good job, not just in North America, but all over the world uh, at teaching people how, you know, what it means to feel a certain way and why those are good for you and, and how we should, um, you know, use everything as a, as a learning point, right? We're, we're taught to avoid anger and to stuff it down. We're taught to um, not cry in public and, you know, don't be embarrassing and don't show the weakness, right? But we then over, you know, I think about the Lego, everything is awesome from the Lego movie, right? And then we have this toxic positivity that forms and people are posting their pretty Instagram videos or their TikTok dances or whatever. But on the background, internally, it is, you know, this house of cards on sand with a windstorm coming through. And it's just not a place that we can sustain. And uh, the meditation has been very poignant and powerful in my own experience. And, and I know for many people who start to explore it, uh, this is this is uh, definitely one of the best tools out there. And the best part is it's free right? We don't have to spend a lot of money or go buy a gadget and track it. We just have to learn how to be with ourselves. So for people who might be very new to the concept of meditation, what is your best recommendation for them to get started? Um, so I'll, I'll go two different routes with that because um, it's a very important question. Um, the first, if they want to learn about meditation from others, um, there are lots of ways to do it for free. Um, of course, there is technology. We, we, we develop technology around everything these days. Yeah. And so there are some really remarkable apps out there. Um, Deepak Chopra has an app. There's Headspace. There's Calm. Um, there are a bunch of different applications you can pay money for that will teach you meditation. Um, I think Headspace is one of the best for, for just a really general approach at meditation for, for everyone. Um, it is non-secular. Um, and there, there are different meditation instructors, different voices now, so that you can kind of identify with someone if you feel that's very helpful for you. And there are a lot of different approaches to meditation in that app that I really like. Um, Sam Harris has his own app, uh, Waking Up. 
Um, yes. It's also a very good app for learning. I think it's better for theory, for learning okay. about meditation more than practice. I think for practice, it's a bit more advanced for most people and maybe not as accessible for some people, but, but it's still a very good app for learning. Um, but if you want to learn for free, there's a lot of great free res resources out there. Um, an organization from Stanford I know has a bunch of free meditations online. You can look on Spotify and different, you know, music players and things to find meditations. Um, you know, YouTube has a lot of great stuff. There's a group called the Honest Guys on YouTube who make a lot of really fun visual meditations. They have a couple that I really like that are focused on the Middle Earth fantasy okay. realm. Yeah. Um, I used one in particular, uh, getting ready for my, my PhD defense years ago, um, where it kind of like puts you in the Shire with the hobbits and you're kind of just like relaxing and <laughs> envisioning this world. Um, and so all of that said there, there are a lot of different kinds of meditation. There's yeah. you know, mindfulness meditation. There's mantra kind of focused meditations. There's a lot of different approaches to meditation. Um, some of them do have some more religious underpinning. Um, so for some people, they're not as into that, but others really do find it helpful. Um, so for instance, I, I know people who come from a Christian background who do find a prayer focused meditation to be mm -hmm. really helpful for them to engage with meditation practice. Um, for myself, when I start teaching people to meditate and I, and I help them kind of finding what works for them, my favorite place to start is where a lot of meditation instructors and guides and you know, resources will tell you to start is just with focusing on your breath. Mm. It's a really easy thing. It allows you to kind of dial in with your own biology, your own rhythms, the things that are happening um, inside of your body and around your body. It's one of the easiest ways, I think, to get into meditation is just to, to learn to sit and be present with yourself and then to use your breath. People can count their breaths as they're going in and out. Um, they can also just you know, take the time to feel what's happening when they're mm. breathing, feel the process of the air coming in and going back out. Um, once they kind of get into that realm, then it's, then it's easier, I think, for a meditation guide to help start accessing some of the other things we can do in meditation. Um, and so for myself, I, I really love focus meditations where um, I focus on different things within myself or around myself or uh, focus on certain objects in a room or focus on the earth as a whole and my place on it. Um, there are a few different kinds of directions to go there. But, but yeah, so there are lots of resources. And I think the easiest way to start for most people is just to sit down in a chair in whatever stance or pose is comfortable and just breathe. Um, eyes wow. open, eyes closed, doesn't really matter. Doesn't matter where your hands are. Um, <laughs> there's, there's no wrong way to do it to get started. Um, getting started is really just about creating something for yourself and just taking some time to be with yourself. Um, once you start that, then you can kind of start exploring a bit deeper. Mm. Um, if anything, there are some more advanced meditation techniques that are out there. I think a lot of people feel like when they start meditating, they have to jump into those techniques immediately. Right. They have to be like the sage with the, the full <laughs> lotus position and the, the hands right. of, of you know, mudra kind of, and they have to like really be in like this deep chanting thing. And they have to be like transcending all of time and space. And, and if they don't have that experience, they're not doing it right. And so something's wrong with them. Right. Um, I've met people who've tried to meditate and, and have found more anxiety um, more stress, more pressure. And honestly, I think it's often because, you know, they feel that it has to be this, this like really right. idealized thing. Yeah. Like they're, 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 you know, some like, religious leader and they're transcending into the heavens. And <laughs> that's really not what it needs to be. It, it can just be as easy as just sitting down with yourself, breathing. And if thoughts are coming at you, that's great. Um, you know, I, I had a, a martial arts instructor when I was a kid who would have us meditate, you know, have us sit down cross-legged, put our hands on our knees and He's like, now clear your mind. Um, and that's the worst phrase in all of meditation. <laughs> Whenever someone tells you to clear your mind, the first thing that happens is your mind becomes extremely cool. full and yeah. compacted with stuff. If anything, it's not about clearing your mind. It's about noticing your mind and being aware mm -hmm. of what your mind does. Um, that's, that's where we begin. We, we begin by noticing the breath, the mind, ourselves. I love that. And it's a, it's a wonderful way to really get to know yourself right? Uh, what you mentioned before about these emotional states having driven a large part of your behavior and you feeling like you could not control them in that moment, uh, really, that is the root of, of all of our behavior, right? There's usually a sensation that develops, and then we either seek to get rid of the sensation or to keep it around. And then that is what is making us have, you know, the choices that we are making because 
we are we are based on these sensations but if we're not conscious of it then of course we find ourselves you know you kind of wake up in the middle of this pattern and you're like oh how did i get here again i i thought i told myself i wouldn't do it but when you don't understand those underlying behaviors when you don't know yourself then you're not able to have the awareness right and it's it is all about awareness so i really like that you said is it's not about clearing the mind it's about noticing the mind and building the awareness of what's going on in your body for you um you know what you said about focusing on something I, somebody the other day told me oh, they couldn't meditate and they just get frustrated and i shared with them that you know they could meditate on the sun and any thought that comes about the sun they just really focus all the energy towards that and they had never heard that before and they thought you know that sounds actually kind of fun i could i could focus on um you know my horses or i could focus on uh, the wind and, you know, they, they kind of got excited about it, which was really fun to see. Um, so I, I'm appreciative that you shared with us some of the different modalities and, and resources people could explore. Yeah. I, th I think for like a lot of artists too, you know, who are first learning how to draw a lot of, a lot of artists will start by drawing objects, you know, they'll, right. they'll start by focusing on something and it's not really about the object. It's about seeing what's there. It's mm. about seeing shapes and lines and seeing how light shines on things. And, and by doing that alone, that's, that's a meditation. It's just, mm. it's noticing, it's noticing right. something and putting some focus there for a period of time, um, whether or not you're drawing it or just thinking about it. Absolutely. And with that drawing analogy, <clears throat> you just reminded me of something that I would have learned in like middle school in my art class, which is, you know, it's also about the negative space in between objects and how that's perceived because you know, this, this air is not empty. It's, it's full of neutrons and electrons and protons. You know, even us, we are 99.999% space, right? And then everything else is vibrating around within that. So, you know, understanding if we focus on even just that, how that shifts our perspective, right? We all see those things that go viral on the internet where it's like, what color is this object? And some people see one color and some people see another, or, you know, if you squint, you can start to see words that are hidden within the image that if you are just staring at it uh, for a second, you won't see. And again, that that comes back around to the perception, right? And how present are you? Are you rushing through so you can't get the layers and the nuance of the perception? Or are you taking that moment to pause and really gather in all the information that you can possibly sense and then leave space for more to come through uh, because oftentimes when we stop trying to force something, that's when it actually happens. Yeah, agreed. So when we were setting this up, you also mentioned the overview effect and tying that to meditation. And obviously, we've talked a lot about perspectives. Could you just give us a brief introduction again to the overview effect for those who may not be so intimately familiar with the concept? And then how could we bring that into our meditation practice, even though we may not have been able to have the chance yet to go into outer space and, and, and have this experience. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, the overview effect, the book was written in 1987 by Frank White. Um, uh, and in the book, he coined the term too, of the overview effect. He starts off by kind of noticing his own experiences flying in you know, an aircraft and looking out and kind of seeing the earth from that far up. It really does change our perspective. You know, I remember as a kid, like watching the movie Dead Poet Society and this idea, you know, of this, this character of Keaty by played by Robin Williams of standing on the desk uh, and having a different perspective of the room around you. Um, the overview effect is, is kind of like that. It's a different perspective, um, primarily by those who have gone into space. So Frank, you know, it was kind of, you know, very bold at the time when he started working on this in the 1980s. Um, he, he told himself, and he, he tells this story often in, in talks that he gives, that he wanted to interview everyone who's gone to space. That, that was his plan, was to interview every single person who's gone to space and ask them questions about the experience. And, and one thing he realized early on from Apollo astronauts to space shuttle astronauts and cosmonauts and everyone who'd gone to space is there were some common themes that kept coming up over and over and over again. Um, you know, noticing the atmosphere of our Earth being so thin and feeling like so fragile that we live just inside of this one little area on the surface of a planet. Uh, a lot of people going to space, uh, as he noticed in this book and, and in these interviews, had this kind of sense of unity, this, this feeling that they're, they're part of humanity. 
by looking at it from the outside, by looking at it from space and seeing our world from so far away, um, a lot of people who had gone to space felt the need to do something when they came back to make the world better, yeah. uh, to improve this position for all of us on the planet. And so even though it's not a, not, not been psychologically tested, there, there's been no rigorous scientific study of the overview effect. It's really kind of difficult to even imagine, like, how would we control for right. that in an experiment to really know, does it, you know, does it always happen? Um, you know, as some people point out, there have been some people who've gone to space who haven't had the best experiences. Um, some people have come back from space and, and have done some things that are questionable as well. Um, and so it's not necessarily something that's like, you know, you go to space and automatically, like, again, like that idea of meditation where you're having this like religious transcendent experience. And now you're some guru or, or God. Um, that, that's not necessarily what it is, but it is a very interesting um, conceptualization that the perspective of seeing the earth from the outside, um, that depth of, of, of a moment of awe, it really does drive a large shift in how a lot of people who go to space see themselves and it shifts a lot in their behavior afterwards. Um, I recall some time back, uh, Deepak Chopra for a while had a, had a podcast. He had Mae Jameson on, and she was speaking ab about you know what space did to her, the, the effect of her going to space. And she came back, and she did want to make a difference. She did want to improve our world. She wanted to help education and and help find you know more equality for other people on the planet. Um, but one thing that she mentioned that I, I to this day I love, and I, I always think about it when I think about going to space. She mentioned that when she came back, she she never since coming back from space has been bothered by rush hour traffic. <laughs> and I love that. That feels like a mindfulness moment, like a meditation moment to me, where it's like it's able to like, you know, spread those moments out and have a different time mm -hmm. perception of when you're stuck in something that's really a bummer, like rush hour traffic. Um, mm -hmm. Rather than being upset about it, you can just embrace it for what it is. And that, that's kind of what the space experience did for her. Um, yeah. And so the overview effect is an interesting concept. And I think, you know, ever since now that a lot more people are thinking about it, a lot more people going to space now have already heard of the overview effect. They kind of are expecting to have this experience. Right. I do wonder long term if we have more and more people going to space. And once we hit the thousands of people who've gone to space, the 10,000s of people who've gone to space, I do wonder if we might get a better conceptualization of, of how this happens, of how this moment of all impacts people. But I personally don't think that going to space will be necessary to have that moment. Mm. I've met lots of people who've traveled the planet who've had great moments of awe from climbing mountains, from exploring distant lands, just from meeting different people. People can have great deep mo moments of awe by watching their children being born or getting married or you know going off to college. Um, we have moments of awe when we um, embrace what death is. Uh, death can be very tragic and hard for us to bear, but it's also part of our lives. And yeah. in those moments when those we love and we care about pass from this world, that gives us those moments of perspective and awe that do feel like they're stretching out longer than usual. And, you know, we can embrace those moments and, and kind of learn more from them. And so I personally think that meditation itself can be the overview effect for everyone. It can actually allow mm -hmm. all of us to kind of gain a better insight into what those moments of all are when they're happening. Mm. That is uh, such a, a beautiful reframe of, and even for myself last year, I sat in a Vipassana where 10 day silent meditation course. And I remember having um, so many experiences and, you know, one moment might've been in pain and another moment in complete bliss, but even just having that frame of those awe inducing moments, even if they might be small, right? Um, then that is still something that can connect us to what's bigger than ourselves and, and having this experience. And we don't always have to make it this big thing, like going to outer space or, you know, even summiting Mount Everest. It, it can be in those smaller moments that we experience day to day. And that by using meditation, that can also help us get there again by being rather than doing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's you know finding those moments to em embrace those moments that we can expand ourselves a little bit inside the moment. Mm, beautiful. I just got this uh, image of of like an accordion kind of opening <laughs> up and this image being revealed, you know, as as it's opening, uh, and so that that kind of 
time collapsing and expanding, you know, it's, it's like when you're doing something that you love and you lose track of time, right. And it feels like it's just been a blink, but it's, it's actually been hours, right. And, yeah. and then the same can happen on the reverse. And so we can actually intentionally play with that through meditation. Absolutely. This is this old, old adage that spending two minutes to boil some water to make your, your oatmeal <laughs> or your eggs feels like forever. Yeah. But sometimes, you know, two minutes with a good friend or a loved one in conversation, it passes by so fast because you're just so in that moment and enjoying it for what it is. Yes, absolutely. Um, I just, I, I think it might be um, from Alice in Wonderland. It's, you know, how long is forever? It might just be one second, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and so it, it really is an eternity can be in a moment, uh, and it can also be a moment can just be, uh, a millisecond, right. And so it's, uh, it's fun to, to play with these different concepts and offer new perspectives. Uh, so I also encourage everyone who's watching this to practice noticing their breath. Um, something that I like to start people with too, is when you're on your computer or digital device, pay attention to your breathing because we actually have this phenomenon now where uh, it's it's been deemed email apnea where people hold their breath around 80% of the time, you know, whatever the statistic was, it's quite high because of whatever reason we start to shallow breathe. So we're not actually fully breathing. Uh, and so just, you know, most of us are digital warriors these days, you know, paying attention to our breath, even in those moments can be very powerful and give us that feeling of being more present and in the moment. And it also helps our nervous system to calm down and, and can give us that opportunity to respond in a much better state than as if we're adrenaline high, cortisol high and, and not getting enough oxygen. Yeah. I, I've not read that. That's awesome to know. Um, yeah. It's something part I, of why I, I think we should just turn off email more often. <laughs> yes. Yeah, actually, so when I I saw something the other day where they're talking about the solar flare and if all technology went down, I was like, would that really be a, such a bad thing? Just yeah. everyone had to sit with themselves for a little bit and go out into nature and connect like human beings. You know, maybe maybe that's what we need. Although maybe, I will maybe say there'd be some more all experiences. I, I recall back in the I want to say early 1990s, there was a major earthquake in Los Angeles, um, and a lot of people who'd grown up in the city. And have been accustomed to city lights at night suddenly yeah. we're without power um now of course that you know sounds terrible and scary for a lot of people and it certainly was but one thing that happened is the local observatory griffith griffith observatory yeah they got a lot of phone calls and later letters from a lot of people who were very concerned and thought maybe that aliens were coming down that maybe there was a <laughs> nuclear bomb going off they yeah. saw this great band of white light in the sky and they had no idea what it was and for some of these people, they were seeing the Milky Way galaxy, the band of our Milky Way wow. galaxy for the first time ever in their lives. Wow. And they would never have seen it if, if that earthquake hadn't happened. That's incredible. And it is, you know, and that is an awe inspiring thing. I still clearly remember being in New Zealand and uh, I was coming up this, this road and it would be like, if you, if you looked up the road, even just at the end of the street where the houses were, you already saw the Milky Way. Right. And it was just so clear. And it was, I mean, I, I kept getting distracted. It took me probably an hour to, to get, you know, a very short distance down this road because I just, every time I'd like look up, get distracted by this, this site, right. That you normally don't get to see. Uh, and so we don't have to go very far in order to experience it. We just need to turn off the lights yeah. <laughs> so that we can see. Amazing. Uh, so Graham, we're, we could talk for hours. I know that, you know, <laughs> we're, we're having such a great time, but I do have some questions for you before we sign off, uh, that I like to ask all of my guests. And cool. so my first question would be, what is your superpower? Mm, I love that. Um, you know, I, I've done a lot of things in my life. Um, I, I've been a connector, uh, a networker for a lot of people. I, I help build community. And I found that to be a superpower. I, I've, I've been very good at connecting people to possible mentors, mentees. Um, I love helping students to build their careers, especially in astrobiology and the space sciences. Um, yeah. I probably speak to maybe five to 10 students a week who wow. just reach out to me through social media and my website and email and who just want some advice on what to do. 
Um, and I do my best now, and it is hard since I'm also very busy. I do my <laughs> best to try to help guide people as much as I can, to offer whatever suggestions I can, but also to connect them to other people and other ideas maybe they haven't heard of before. Mm. Um, and so, and I, and I love doing that. I love being that for, for people in the world. Um, I do find myself as, as someone who can inspire in others, um, an interest in space exploration, astrobiology, and learning more about our place in the cosmos. And, and I hope maybe that's just because I like to read a lot. And I, I really <laughs> am a nerd for books and for just, just sharing yeah. stories. I think we are storytellers. Yes. Uh, we love to engage and share our stories together. And so I, I love being that. I will say these last four years, I've really found myself being a father. Um, mm. And I, I think being a father has really changed my experience of being human in a way that I, I didn't really quite comprehend beforehand. And so uh, even tonight, my, my son last night before bed, I, I make up a story every night for him before bed. And then I sing him a song. Uh, last night, he requested a unicorn story tonight. And so tonight, <laughs> I have to think of a story of a unicorn that flies and sings songs. Um, and so, you know, that, that's part of my day is doing that. And so that, that for me is a superpower, being the best version of me as a father that I can be. Beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. And you certainly have inspired me, actually, as we've been going through this podcast in the back of my mind, I've had this thought of, hmm, maybe I need to go and study astrobiology. You do. <laughs> <laughs> and it also made me think, based on your definition of astrobiology, that I am already one. Uh, and it's just more, maybe some more formal training that I can invite in and that, um, you know, that would be a very fun thing to do. So you are very inspiring uh, and, and your answer to your superpowers is, is also very inspiring. So with, with that, uh, who do you turn to in those moments where you may feel stuck or you may feel like you need some extra guidance yourself? You know, you're the one who's often giving that to other people, but when you need to reflect and, and get advice from others, who's on your personal board of directors? Yeah, I, I have a few people who I do actively reach out to in reality. Um, yeah. You know, my, my, my PhD advisor, Alexis Templeton at CU Boulder is a remarkable person and a great researcher. Um, I've reached out to her over the years from time to time with questions um, about being a scientist, uh, about her life as a researcher. Um, I and mean, I have questions within our field of geomicrobiology and astrobiology. I know that I can turn to her um, when it comes to business and business development. The CEO of my company, Blue Marble Space, uh, Dr. Sanjoy Sam is a great friend, but also someone I can rely on for a very human and empathetic answer to what it's been like for him on this journey as an entrepreneur and you know, working in the nonprofit realm and, and things like that. Um, you know, of course, I have my spouse, uh, my wife, Amanda. Uh, she's always super helpful for me to bounce ideas back and forth with. Uh, when she and I first met in college, we were both interested in wildlife biology and space exploration. And so we were, we were both doing things kind of in, in space and wildlife. Um, and we knew that we wanted to pursue careers in that realm. Yeah. Uh, I ended up pursuing space exploration and, and space sciences and astrobiology. Amanda ended up pursuing wildlife, science, ecology, evolutionary biology. Um, after our graduate degrees, she ended up spending some time at the Humane Society and now she's the executive director of our local wildlife rehab. And so, you know, all these years later, we're still working in these realms that we're interested in. She's helping yeah. to, you know, rescue and, and, and rehabilitate local wildlife, local animals, um, which is something I also care very deeply about and helping our world. And then we also have the space side of what we do as well and can talk to all these cool people across yeah. the industry in space. I love that. It's uh, really from, from the earth. Uh, into into space, right? And you guys have both sides of that spectrum. Uh, so I'm sure the stories that that your son gets are are encompassing of all of that. That's that's a really cool place because it is a reminder. You know, there's a lot of us out there who are so passionate about space and space exploration that sometimes we forget about the other things that are as awe inspiring and uh, important to connect to and and be a part of right in our day-to-day -day experience here on earth uh, and we don't have to choose one we can have both yeah beautiful Absolutely. so graham then my final question is based on our conversation today and and everything that you've shared with us how would you say that you best represent or serve humanity yeah i, I again go back to being an inspirer of other people um you know I, i've done a lot in my own life to care for animals to care for people 
Um, I will say that as a young person, I started training in the martial arts very young. Um, I think it's very valuable as a way of building mm -hmm. some discipline and learning how to protect ourselves against violence. But it also taught me to, to be active when I need to be, um, mm -hmm. to respond when I need to. Um, I've been in several moments in my life where something happened or was about to happen. And a lot of us are never taught how to react when we need to. Um, you know, I, as much as I love to be present in the moment and feel the moment, sometimes you just have to jump and do something to save someone's life right. um, or to help somebody out who's in need. And I think for me, the martial arts training helped a lot in that realization of being aware of when somebody else near me needed someone to catch them quickly or to do something quickly for them. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, as much as I try to do those smaller things in my own life to be there for my family, for my son, um, and to be there for others, I do think inspiring other people has been kind of my biggest gift so far to others. Um, and as much as I've been inspired by Carl Sagan and all of his wonderful books and works by by other great authors, both currently alive and of the distant past, you know, have taught me so much about the world and my friends who I've learned so much from you know, about their place in the world and the things they've experienced, the stories they've shared. If anything, I, I feel like someone who just takes all of that and then tries to find some way to make it accessible for someone else mm. when we're having a conversation. Beautiful. Yes. And, and that's, that's also another point is making it accessible, right? Because some, sometimes these concepts are so deep and technical uh, and to be able to inspire people, we need to make it relatable and find those ways to connect. And ultimately that's what being human is all about. Yeah, absolutely. Amazing. Well, Dak Graham, this has been amazing. I, I, I'm really looking forward to having you on the show again in the future and to seeing you soon, hopefully, uh, if not, maybe at a conference, maybe around a campfire someday, sharing some stories here on earth while looking up at the stars. Um, where can people find you if they'd like to listen to your, your podcast on astrobiology, or if they just like to reach out and connect with you and ask you some questions? Yeah, the, the best way to find out about my show called Ask an Astrobiologist is to go to the NASA Astrobiology YouTube channel. Uh, we have okay. all of the videos of the show there. You can watch all of our past episodes. It's also where we broadcast live episodes. We have one episode every month. Um, we bring in astrobiologists from a variety of backgrounds, different kinds of research um, to talk about their work. Uh, I, I often have people reach out to me. It turns out I'm often on NASA TV because of that. And so if you go to a NASA center, uh, you might see me up on you know, the TV talking to someone. Um, it's an episode of my show that's going on. Usually they show them at the different NASA centers uh, where visitors can go. But if you want to reach out to me and just talk, um, my, my website, cosmobiota.com, is the easiest way to find me and all of my different social media handles. Um, you can send me a, a contact link through my website. Um, I'm more than happy to try to connect, my time allowing. Um, I always try to remind people that, you know, I do get very busy. I do speak to a lot of people every week. And so I try my best to get back as fast as I can, but I can't always respond immediately. It does take some time. Um, but I try my best to answer everyone who reaches out, especially those who have questions about astrobiology or meditation, martial arts, or all the other things I do that we didn't talk about. I, I do a lot of other stuff too, in fitness and weightlifting and all kinds of other things. So yeah. um, always <laughs> that for people. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for everybody who's watching. Uh, you can see it here on the video and I'll also comment with that. It's in the show notes. So no matter if you're watching us on LinkedIn, YouTube, or Facebook, you've got all the links there to connect with Graham. Uh, Graham, thank you again. This has been amazing. And uh, I look forward to seeing you again very soon. Awesome, Sarah. It's been great. Bye, everyone.